The title of my talk is Shooting Stars to Making Stars, following the present TEDx theme of Pharaoh's The Guiding Light. So here in the opening slide, you can see a beautiful image of uh, uh, Perseids shooting stars flying all across the sky. Now you might wonder how distant this is, how distant it is from your daily lives. Well, uh, as a matter of fact, it's not distant from your life at all. So the Perseids shooting stars peaks on August 11th, which is tomorrow. So if you go to a dark spot with clear skies, and if you look up the sky, you will see a scene, something very similar to this image. So it's, it's very close to your daily lives in so many ways. So just to give you a brief introduction to meteors or shooting stars, because probably shooting stars is a much more fun, cool name to call them. So meteors are just uh, dust particles and uh, bits of rocks coming from space. And uh, they burn in the Earth's atmosphere. And uh, when they intersect with the Earth, they burn due to friction and create these bright streaks of light. And uh, you could see them as shooting stars all across the sky. So here you see various images where it's, all, it's almost like raining meteors, raining fireworks, natural fireworks on the sky. So why do we study these small bodies in the solar system? Why do we care at all? So the reason is, the simple answer is, meteors, comets, asteroids, these are all small bodies in the solar system, and uh, they can be near Earth objects. So they can come close to Earth, they can actually hit the Earth, so in many ways, the calculation of Earth impact probabilities is very important for the safety of the Earth. And it's very important for the health of our own planet. So it's very vital that we study, observe, track these objects. So here you might see this like a funny cartoon. Um, but it was not funny for the dinosaurs at that time. So about uh, 65 million years back, so uh, a big meteor blast, which actually led to the extinction of a whole species of dinosaurs. So these things have happened in history, and it shows how high impact and how dangerous some of these bodies can be. So this again might look like a Hollywood sci-fi movie climax scene, but the, the reality is not that far different. So this looks like a huge fireball coming and hitting the Earth. Now, if you look at the next slide, this is not far from reality. So this is a real Barringer meteor crater in the Arizona desert in America. I remember visiting this crater last year, so I can confirm it's a real feature on Earth. And this happened due to a meteor hit about 50,000 years back. So these are real signatures or remnants of Earth getting impacted by small bodies from the solar system. Now forget about uh, 65 million years back and 50,000 50, years back. These are all things in the distant past. If you look at in a much more recent times, let's say about 10 years back, in 2013, there is this huge meteor blast in a place called uh, Chelyabinsk in Russia. And uh, hundreds of buildings were damaged. Thousands of people were hospitalized and there were loads of injuries due to shattered glass uh, flying due to these shock waves from this meteor blast. So this clearly shows these uh, threats are real. And some of these recent events led to greater awareness in studying and tracking these bodies. So here you can see a map of impacts. So in this impact maps, it's, it's pretty clear that Earth is getting bombarded by bodies of different sizes all the time. So it's not as rare as we think. So there are new observations and calculations which show that the frequencies is higher than what we thought before. So it's very important that we track them. It's important that we regularly monitor the health of our own planets 
and assess this risk factor from outer space. So this is a database from about 20 years of observations, and you see there are lots of uh, impact events on our planet Earth. So what's the practical aspect of meteor science? So if you ask me, the simple answer is, uh, meteors can cause threats to satellites, spacecraft, our own astronauts, and so on. So we need to navigate uh, space missions between these meteoroid stream clusters, shooting star clusters. And here in this image, you can see it's a pretty crowded place. So in this image, you see different uh, meteoroid streams. And it's quite challenging to send the space mission and satellites without impacting any of these things. So uh, constant monitoring, understanding the trajectory evolution, past, present, and future modeling of these uh, meteoroid particles or shooting stars is vital for the protection of uh, satellites and spacecraft from these impacts. So in 1993, the same Perseids meteor shower we are talking about in the August in 1993, it led to killing of a space mission. So there was this Olympus One uh, mission by a European Space Agency, and the whole mission got disrupted due to a Perseids meteor strike. So these things can happen. Now, it's not all bad news. It's not just about uh, dangers to astronauts or spacecraft. These are also very spectacular, magnificent uh, things to look at. It's a celestial treat. It's almost like natural fireworks on, on our own planet. So here you see a woodcut engraving from 1833 Leonid's meteor storm. And this was done by the monks at that time. And you can see it is like raining meteors, raining shooting stars. This is about, uh, the estimates say it's about one million shooting stars per hour. So it would have been a spectacular scene. And there are lots of eyewitness reports from that time which says what a magical experience it was. What a great impression it made in those people at that time. You can see, you can feel it from the ways they describe this event in their records. So it's one of those Leonid's meteor storm events, although on not, not on that scale, of a smaller scale, which actually triggered my interest into meteor astronomy. So it, in 1998, when I was barely 13 years old, when I was a young teenager, I remember my mentor encouraging me to look up the sky, and I saw these uh, beautiful shooting stars. And that actually encouraged me to learn about these objects, to read more about these objects, and also eventually get into this game of meteor science. So I remember looking up the skies, uh, uh, those days we had pristine skies in Kerala with very little li light pollution. So as a small uh, village boy, I remember when my parents and grandparents used to drop me at uh, railway stations in the night time, I used to see these beautiful uh, shooting stars on the sky above the beautiful Nila River in Kerala. And uh, that actually captured my imagination and sort of encouraged me to get into this world of meteor astronomy. So I didn't know much at that time. At those days, we didn't have career guidance gurus and so on. All I knew was this is a beautiful thing to look at, but I wanted to know more about it, but I didn't know how. But the fate had uh, more interesting plans, I guess. So I was privileged to study uh, meteor science from the Leonid's uh, meteor science guru himself. At 13 years old, I was watching Leonid's as a clueless uh, small kid in Kerala from a small village. But in 2013, I was doing PhD under the supervision of a meteor expert, Dr. David Asher, a British astronomer, who predicted the very same uh, meteor storm which happened in 1998, which I watched from the skies in the small village in Kerala. So it was almost like uh, life coming back in full circle, as they say, like a cosmic cycle. So uh, we did a lot of interesting uh, calculations. He, he taught me how to compute trajectories of these shooting stars. And uh, my collaborators and myself, we did interesting work related to relativity, resonances, and so on in meteoroid streams. So years went by. And interestingly, some of the meteor experts uh, nominated my name last year to the International Astronomical Union and they announced a minor planet 33928 Ashwin Shaker in recognition of my work in meteor science. So this came with an official citation. So you can see the citation here from the IAU Minor Planet Center. 
So in the citation it says, I am apparently the first professional meteor astronomer from India in modern times. So uh, note the word modern times. So I don't consider this as a personal achievement. I just think this is, I would like to dedicate this honor to the countless uh, great ancient astronomers from India and other parts of the world who have looked at the sky, seen shooting stars, and who were capt captivated and who studied these objects uh, much before my time. So that's the way I look at it. Now here you see an orbit diagram of my own minor planet. It's between the orbits of uh, Mars and Jupiter. And you can see the orbit is much more eccentric than other bodies in the image, which probably also matches with my personality. So there's a little bit high eccentricity there. Then here you can see an image which was uh, sent by my friend Rob Work, who is an expert, excellent uh, observational astronomer, who actually found the first interstellar asteroid in human history. So he sent me this image of my minor planet, which was taken by this uh, powerful Pan Stars telescope in Hawaii Islands in America. So Pan Stars is a network of uh, telescopes which uh, searches and scans the sky for killer asteroids and so on. So this, these international honors gave me an opportunity to uh, speak and interact with uh, thousands of students all across India. And uh, it's fascinating to see so much interest from youngsters uh, about astronomy and space science. So um, because of these opportunities in interacting with people, I find it like a cosmic duty from my side to inspire youngsters and younger generation into astronomy and space science. So that's the way I look at it. So I conduct and curate uh, various science outreach events in India as well as abroad. And uh, I try my best to sort of spread the magic of astronomy to youngsters and uh, students in uh, rural schools and tribal schools and so on. So you might wonder why you need to do this. The, the simple answer is pure science is very enchanting and interesting. The second point is uh, with the growing space sector these days, it's always nice to have more young bright minds into this, uh, into this game. So another thing which I'm very passionate about is to do telescope donation programs for rural and tribal schools in India. So we, I coordinate various donation of telescopes with help from generous philanthropists, policy makers, educators, and so on. So recently we did a telescope donation to the APJ Abdul Kalam Tribal School at Attapadi in Palakkad district in Kerala. Um, this school is named after the legendary rocket man APJ Abdul Kalam. And we thought it's only befitting that uh, we gift a telescope to that school to inspire more young kids from there to space science. So the idea is to inspire more people from rural and tribal backgrounds because I came from a rural background. I came from a small village in Kerala. And those days I never had people to really uh, guide me. We didn't have career guidance experts to sort of steer these things in our way. So I find it as a, a little, little bit like a giving back to the society to just guide them in the right direction because I see so much talent and potential in rural and tribal students all across India. It's just that sometimes they don't get the right opportunities. So all you need is a little bit of a push, a little bit of Delta X from someone can take them to places. They can reach the stars. So my dream and vision, like a guiding light in this theme, is to see one telescope for every school in India. So if every school has uh, one microscope, and if they can scan the micro world and see the microbes, why not one telescope for every school to scan the skies and to scan the celestial bodies and understand about these bodies in outer space? So that's very much a doable project these days. It's a feasible thing to do. We are not talking about these huge telescopes which uh, cost hundreds of crores and so on. We are just talking about a decent sized telescope and that's very much practical and feasible in today's world. It might cost somewhere between 10,000 to 20,000 rupees and uh, it's not, although a telescope is an astronomical instrument, it doesn't cost 
astronomical amounts of money for a decent sized telescope. So this is something we could do. If people come together, we could uh, create a network where we could actually give decent sized telescope to every deserving rural and tribal school in different parts of India. Because it will be the next generation of space scientists and astronomers who are going to be key in protecting our own planet from, from these killer asteroids and dangerous bodies. And we would also need a young workforce in future for our own growing space sector, both private as well as government, because as you know, today private players are also getting into this game of space science. And uh, it's important that we encourage maximum youngsters to join hands and come, in, come into this workforce. So my humble vision and takeaway message is one telescope in every school can really make stars on this planet. Thank you very much.